one's not working. Is it? Is it not supposed to be green? Is it supposed to be green? Speak. Hello? Yeah, it's working. Good evening, everyone. If we want to make a start, a um, meeting of the corporate issues and reform of the committee held at this fantastic facility, the Fire and Rescue Training and Safety Centre. The first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. We have apologies from Councillor Dave Morgan from Trafford, Councillor Joanne Marshall from Wigan, Councillor Theresa Smith from Tameside, and Councillor Callum Nolan from Rochdale. We have a substitute in attendance, which is Councillor Ray Dutton from Rochdale. And we're also informed that Councillor Sarah Smith from Berry will need to leave the meeting early. She's got another meeting at um, uh, Berry Town Hall. So the next item is appointment of chair for the municipal year of 19. Nominations, please. Could I nominate Tim Pickstone, please? Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. So if we appoint Councillor Tim Pickstone as Chair of the Corporate Issues and Reform of Review and Scrutiny Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think the first thing to do is we, is we need to, to thank the, the staff from the fire service for the, the tour this afternoon of this, this excellent facility. Um, we had an excellent time. You, you missed a tree town, in fact. But we all, we all took photos, so we can show you them later on. <laughs> No, but thank you very much. It was a, a really useful visit and, and, a, and an excellent facility. Okay, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations that have been identified before the meeting? Does anybody need to declare any interest in any item on the agenda? It's probably a good time to say that people need to have filled in their um, register of interest forms if they haven't already. Have they be, all been received or they're all on their way? Not all have been received, Chair. Yeah, okay, so, so, so we, if people could, could, could get those in. Minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of June. Does anybody wish to move those as a correct record? I move, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, John. Okay. And then the next agenda item is the work programme. So people will recall that at the last meeting we had a discussion on the work programme and people came up with various ideas. Um, so, so since then, the work program has been populated, um, I suppose, starting with the, the things that we know we have to do as a committee around finances. So some of the budget things have been put in um, where they have to be. Um, and, and I guess the mayor has been invited to the appropriate meetings yes. for those. He's confirmed his attendance. Okay. Um, what, what, we, what we still need to do is we still need to put in um, some more things from the fire service, I think, that, that may well become apparent after we've had a, some discussions today about finding out what the, the key issues are and when they need to be slotted in. And then people will see that the, the, the meetings that are coming up in the autumn are fairly heavily populated. Um, possibly at the September meeting, there's perhaps one too many things, I feel. Perhaps that there's four things at the moment and might, we might see if one of those could, could wait till a later meeting rather than trying to rush four things at one meeting unless, unless people object to that. Um, we then also have a training session. So there is no formal meeting in August, but um, the, the Treasurer, Richard Paver, is going to do a training session for members um, to help us better scrutinize the budget setting process, essentially. So that is at 6 p.m. on our normal slot in Oxford, presumably at Churchgate House. Is that right, Joanne? Yes, that's yeah. right. Is there anything I've missed out of that from, no. from your point of view? Does anybody have any comments or questions on the work programme? Yes. <coughs> yeah, I mean, just uh, I, I do recall a couple of years ago when uh, the committees were set up, it was a matter of guidance as more than policy, that the meeting should be two hours and there should be two major substantive items in each meeting, um, an hour for each, which seemed to make sense. So it does look as though on a couple of these meetings we, we've moved away, away from that and we should try if we can. I know we've got a lot to get through to try and stick to that general principle. A, a very good point. I, mean, I, I suspect what we should perhaps try to do is is never have more than two big substantive issues, but it may be that there's a couple of items that are just for information that 
that we have to see as a committee, but we're not going to spend more than five minutes on, I suppose. But you're right, we need to do things properly um, rather than half-heartedly, don't we? Any other comments or questions? Just Councillor Duffield. Sorry, uh, just a, a quick one. Um, the 13th of August meeting, we would normally meet on the third the third Tuesday of the month, not the second. I don't know. That's, that doesn't, that's just outside of our normal cycle. Just a minor. Yeah, but we normally do it on the third. It was to fit in with Richard Paver as well, being able to do the session okay. as the, the treasurer. This is available. Okay. I, th I think, I mean, in August, I suspect there's never going to be no time that we can all come to, is there? So we're just going to have to do, do what we can there. Any other comments or questions on the work program? Okay, so if, if we agree that for now, but obviously that's going to develop as the year goes on. Kevin, you are very welcome. Okay, so we're good. The, the main items that we're going to be looking at today are two big items from the fire service, and so we're going to start with the, the annual performance report for 2018-19, and Tony, you're going to lead on that, is that right? That's correct, Chair, thank you very much. Within the public pack, you'll find uh, from page 16 is the executive summary, and then page 21 onwards is the corporate scorecard. Now, this corporate scorecard is used by the service to measure our performance against our key performance indicators, but is actually then used by area and by station by their own scorecards to measure their own local performance. And as was mentioned earlier, we're extremely keen for committee members to be engaged in that activity and that performance on a local level so that you understand what the challenges are for the fire and rescue services locally while seeing what it is in terms of a, a GM-wide in this committee. So we will be sending your contact details on to our local managers and they will be making contact with you to uh, engage with you locally and uh, so you are fully aware of what the Fire and Rescue Service is doing locally as well. Um, so if I can refer you to the executive summary, um, starting from the top, um, we talk about the number of incidents when comparable to a previous year. So we're looking at an outturn report here of 1819. So um, in 1819, our number of incidents that we attended, uh, not the number of fire engines we sent, the number of actual incidents saw a 3.61% reduction across the board, which meant that we t attended 31,766 incidents in total in 2018-2019. Now, in terms of our response, nationally they now measure response from when the uh, the call handling facility, which is our Northwest Fire Control Center in Warrington, receives a call to when the first appliance books in attendance, so on the fire engine, there's what we call a, a radio mobile um, data terminal, which they press to, to close down at the incident, so that the, st the clock stops at that point. So the time that you're seeing here, so to give an, to give an example, last year, or the 18-19, uh, the average response time for that first appliance across Greater Manchester, uh, sorry, across the UK, was um, 8 minutes 45 seconds. But in fact, in Greater Manchester, we responded on average within 7 minutes and 14 seconds. So as you can see, over a minute faster than the national average. So that's our first appliance. And then we start talking about the types of incidents. So an accidental dwelling fire which is uh, uh, bullet point number four, paragraph number four. An accidental dwelling fire is something like a cooking uh, fire, uh, a fire that happens in the home that obviously we have, we have accidental and then we have deliberate stroke malicious. So we're talking about accidental dwelling fires here. We saw a decrease of 5% uh, during 2018-2019. Um, again, when talking about deliberate fires, we saw in 2018-29, a decrease of 9% across Greater Manchester. Um, it, there, there were a number, number of Mets that had, saw an increase, uh, London being one of them, but we in fact saw a significant decrease of 9%. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate our primary role within the Fire and Rescue Service, or primary aim, is to try and have zero fire deaths across the year. That's, our, that's what we strive for. Now, with regards to last year, 2018-2019, uh, 
Unfortunately, we saw 19 people die as a result of fire-related incidents, six of, 16 of which were accidental. However, the previous year, that was 21 fire-related deaths, 11 of which were accidental. I believe uh, previously we have discussed, but we'll be bringing further information to the committee regarding the challenge, which is our fa false alarms. Now, um, false alarms, and the false alarms are ones received by automatic fire alarm systems, AFAs, account for across the UK 40% of all the incidents they attend. That's national fire rescue services. So 40% of incidents are automatic fire alarm uh, related. Now, for us in, in Greater Manchester, uh, we saw a 1% increase in the year that we're stating here. Um, and, and again, it states 39% of our false alarms, uh, uh, incidents were false alarms. Um, we are in the process of piloting a concept of reducing those in non-domestic premises. So they're those premises that don't have a sleeping risk, aren't hospitals, aren't those facilities when you can reasonably expect people not to be able to get out of the, uh, unassisted out of the property or be, be asleep at the time. Um, so we are piloting that and we are seeing a, uh, very much an improvement in those areas and we'll strive to do that because every false alarm that we attend, obviously we don't attend a false alarm, we get mobilised or sent to an automatic fire alarm, then it results in a false alarm. Uh, to attend that you've got a 12 tonne fire engine proceeding to an incident on blue lights, so you've got the road risk to the, the firefighters on the fire engine, to the, the other road users, then you've got the disruption to the properties that are involved. Um, and then you've got the disruption in terms of the working time for the firefighters, that, so they could be uh, in between training, they could be undertaking a safe and well visit, a school visit, but they have to drop that, get onto the fire engine, go to the uh, automatic fire alarm, and then on a significant number of occasions find that it's a false alarm. Uh, Safe and wells, you've probably heard the term, hopefully you've heard the term. Safe and well is where we go into people's properties, advising them on the risk of fire and fit if required uh, smoke alarms. And if, again, if required, we let other agencies know of, know of any concerns that may be raised during that visit. But the primary aim is to reduce the, the, the risk of fire. Now, uh, in 2018-2019, we saw um, our uh, firefighters and other support staff uh, undertook 27,000 um, uh, safe and well visits. Uh, that was a decrease of 18%. There are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of the most significant reasons was the uh, significant moorland fires that we dealt with during last year. Um, not only the period of time that it took us to deal with the incidents because they were undertaken over a protracted period of time, but that getting back to business as usual, recovering after three weeks of intensive firefighting operations, equipment, training, uh, recovery of those crews because they were working 24 seven, uh, took some time and therefore we, we took the decision to divert our time and resources getting uh, crews back to operational readiness rather than uh, concentrating on the safe and wells during that period. Uh, paragraph number 11 talks about uh, uh, sickness levels. So the level of sickness absence in GMFRS in 2018-2019 stood at uh, 4.03, which was de a decrease from 4.72 the previous year. Summary is the uh, corporate scorecard. There are a number of sub uh, KPIs there you might want to ask questions about, but again, we will be asking uh, local managers to contact you to talk in detail about the local performance. Thank you, Tony. Any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Dutton. Could I just ask on your percentages uh, where you say this uh, 4.72? Could that be split down into operational staff as well as uh, backroom staff? Yes, it can do. Yes. I was just wondering if that information would be readily available and doing a comparison then across the other uh, brigades. Yes, I can provide that for next meeting or outside of this meeting. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else? Could I just ask a question about um, gender of staff? Is that all right? So, so on um, page page 26 in our pack, uh, 
am, am I right in saying that we had a, a particularly low, low rate of female firefighters compared to other Met fire, fire services? You are correct in that. We've made significant strides uh, over uh, uh, recent years. In fact, our recruits for last year, on average 30% were female. Uh, but over the period of um, years where we've not recruited the number of firefighters brought in that were, were female were very, very low. Uh, we know we've got some work to do that with that, and we have, it has been recognised through the Her Majesty's Inspectorate that we've got that work to do, and we recognise as a management team and an organisation that we need to do that. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, you've mentioned that there will be some uh, contact uh, with local officers, as it were. I think that would be extremely helpful, because whilst this presents a, a sort of broad picture across Greater Manchester, I suspect that when we break this down, there will be specific issues in each of the, uh, the ten boroughs, as it were, uh, that, that, that need to be uh, 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 addressed, and perhaps that local members, as it were, might be able to, um, to take on board. So. I think it would be useful if, if when those visits take place, those meetings take place, that we do have that breakdown of statistics uh, into the 10 districts, as it were, as opposed to the, if you like, global picture that we're being presented with uh, you know, on, on this occasion. Yes, and, and actually we make a, a huge demands on our managers to know their local risks and to, f to provide a service that deals with that local risk. Obviously, there's a different risk with Manchester as there is with Tameside, Bolton, and in fact, Bury. So yes, they will have that information to hand. Okay, is that everybody? Okay, thank you very much, Tony, much appreciated. Okay, so the next substantial fire agenda item is the Fire Services Programme for Change. And is that with you, Jim? Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for your kind comments, Chair, about the facility here. It's uh, certainly something we are very proud of, and uh, I think there's many people who get a great deal of benefit out of this facility from the community, um, and hopefully we can continue to develop it and use it even in wider arenas than, than we are at the present time, but uh, it's certainly a great asset to Manchester and the, the people that we serve, so thank you. The Programme for Change, Chairman, is... Um, quite a complex issue as, as we touched on at the last meeting and, and I think to try and talk, uh, talk us through the presentation we're going to break it up into different speakers including Don Docks, the Deputy Chief Officer and, and Leon Parks, our Assistant Chief Officer. Uh, but I think it might be useful just to set the context around this if I invited Kevin Lee from the Mayor's Office to, to introduce some of the background to it if that's acceptable Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, the Mayor apologises that he's not able to be here himself this evening. As you know, he has previously attended the scrutiny committee on this particular subject, um, but unfortunately has an engagement this evening and has asked me to come along just to give some background. So perhaps, Chair, with your forbearance, if I speak to the first couple of slides and then hand back to Jim and the team for the detailed stuff. So in terms of the background, I think it's worth going back even to 2016. Um, when the then fire authority was due to issue redundancy notices to all of its frontline firefighters. Um, the mayor at that time was a candidate um, and was contacted by the fire brigades union um, along with the chair of the then fire authority um, and managed to resolve that in terms of redundancy notices were withdrawn. But I think that sets a, a scene um, for members of this committee to consider what then happened once the mayor was elected in May 2017. From circa 2010 through to May 2017, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service had somewhere in the region of 20 million pounds of cuts over those seven, eight years um, that they were having to deal with. There was a 2016 integrated risk management plan that by the time the mayor was elected and the deputy mayor, Baroness Beverly Hughes, was appointed, was being implemented at that particular time. There were, uh, in the region of 167 frontline firefighter vacancies, and a number of stations were in a state of disrepair. 
there were, well, there was a lack of female facilities at a number of the stations at that particular time. There was a seven million pound budget gap in the finances for GMFRS. And I think it would be fair to say, and this is no reflection I have to add on the current management team, because it was a different management team at that time, there was very low morale within the service. The frontline firefighters were on a system called roster reserve, which meant they could be called in even when they were due to be on days off between their shift system. They had an annual leave system which was imposed effectively upon them where they had no real choice over when they were able to take their annual leave. So there were a whole number of issues within the service. We then know that we had the horrendous attack on the Manchester Arena and there were repercussions then for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. We then had the Walkdom Fire where firefighters raised issues of concern with the Mayor and Deputy Mayor at that particular time in terms of crewing levels and pumps. We had the implementation ongoing of the IRMP and then we had the Kerslake report that reported in around May 2018. So this is taking you through, I'm not going through every line chair of the slide in front of you, but it gives you that broad background and that slide pulls out some of the key um, dates around that. Following the Kerslake report into the Manchester Arena attack and looking into further detail around the then IRMP, it was found there was a real a lack of an evidence base to support some of the decisions that were highlighted in the IRMP at that time. So the Mayor took the decision to suspend parts of the IRMP and then following Kerslake to undertake a root and branch review of the service. That then resulted in program for change, which is in the final bullet on um, the first slide, and work commenced on developing the outline business, business case. At that point, the mayor and the deputy mayor visited every single fire station across Greater Manchester, including the headquarters and main offices. They met directly with both operational and non-operational staff across the service and heard directly from them. As a result of that, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor took a decision to change the shift system, moving it from the roster reserve to a more, if you like, family-friendly and firefighter-friendly shift system. A decision was also taken to change the way annual leave was allocated so that the firefighters actually got more choice in when they were able to take their annual leave, but also had more certainty about when that annual leave would be coming, more on a kind of cyclical uh, kind of basis. There was a capital program instituted to address some of the issues of disrepair and the lack of female facilities at some of our stations. Firefighter, firefighter recruitment was accelerated at that particular time to deal with the vacancy issue and also to address an overtime issue where overtime had been being paid at standard rate and was increased to what would normally be considered normal overtime rates. I believe it was one and a half times or, or two times, depending on when it, uh, when it was. So overtime was improved. And it's worth stating that in May 2017, there were 1121 firefighters in post. The 2016 IRMP that was due for implementation would have reduced that number to 1058. And as of May this year, sorry, late, yeah, May this year, there were 1183 firefighters in post. So I think it's worth me saying, Chair, that some of the stories that have been portrayed about the Mayor cutting the fire service are not accurate when you actually look at those figures. It's also important to note, as the slide indicates, that the Mayor and Deputy Mayor said very specifically that there should be a frontline first approach. Now that very clearly does have implications for the service as a whole when you actually have to address a budget deficit um, that, that we, we know we have to address. So therefore, 
part of the programme for change, and I won't go into the details because colleagues will be able to do that, looked at the service overall in terms of where savings potentially could be made, whether that be through the operational or the non-operational um, side of the service. I think it's also fair to say from the information that firefighters gave to the Mayor and Deputy Mayor during their visits that they, it was noticeable that their role had changed over a period of time. So whereas in other services, firefighters were still undertaking some of the youth engagement work and actually going into schools and talking to some young people and actually having activities with young people, some of that had been taken away from the firefighters in Greater Manchester and was being done by a very able, but nevertheless a different team, the youth engagement team, working in conjunction with the Prince's Trust. There are other issues around safe and well visits, whether actually it was appropriate for firefighters to undertake safe and well visits, which included asking about how many cigarettes someone smoked or how much they drank or whether they took drugs or issues like that, where they hadn't, in their view, had the appropriate training for that kind of activity. And there were other issues that were raised by the firefighters and the other staff. So all of those issues had to be addressed within the program for change and outline business case. I think probably if I f uh, finish their chair, hand over to the team to do the detail, but if I may, I'll come back to address some of those issues that I've kind of outlined at the end there in terms of the proposals as we go forward. Thanks, Kevin. I've chaired there. There's, there we go. Um, given the, the backdrop that, that Kevin has just described to you, it, I think it's quite important to, to stress that whilst there were things that, that had been highlighted, there was also an opportunity presented itself to the organisation to embrace this whole approach to change. Um, one of the challenges was perhaps around the speed of change because perhaps in, in Greater Manchester, change hadn't progressed at the rate which maybe uh, many other fire services had across the country. So things that we were, were going to take on board, um, linked back to what, what Kevin was describing, had perhaps taken place in some other organisations some time ago. So the challenge was for us to try and put something together that not only provided those change and, and the change agents, but also had to compress it into perhaps a, a slightly shorter period of time than, than was ideal. And I think that's what, what we were, were challenged with doing. And certainly the approach that we, we've tried to take with the review, which we'll go into in a bit more detail, is built upon these, these three fundamentals. One was that we would listen, that we would listen to staff, as, as Kevin has described, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor, feedback to us, but also uh, as part of the information gathering process, we would listen to the staff and take the concerns and provide that feedback to them and building it into any proposals that we might have as, as a programme for change recommendations. Something which I think we have actually been good at, perhaps not in formalising it, but in the way that we've tried to do it operationally, is learning from major incidents. But I think there was some evidence to suggest that we hadn't captured that in the way that was beneficial and that the organisation maybe wasn't a learning organisation. And that's something, of course, that is fundamental for us from an operational perspective, certainly, that we cannot ignore and we've already embraced that quite significantly in, in how we're moving forward. And finally, change. Um, change is not always something that, that comes easily to any organisation, and, and I don't think GMFRS is any different to that, but I think what we've tried to do is also underpin it by making sure that the change is managed and planned in a much more structured, inclusive way than perhaps we've done in the past, um, and building on the two previous principles, making sure that the change is inclusive and done with people rather than to people, and that's very much the philosophy, the philosophy that we're underpinning in the approach that we've taken. In terms of the, the rest of the slides, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Leon Parks now, but there's a, quite a lot of content within the slides, and, and like Kevin, we don't plan to go through every single item, but we needed to get the information to you, particularly around the consultation feedback, because there has, a, has been quite a bit, and we've tried to, although you may not think so, we've tried to distill it into a reasonable size of content that you'll be able to digest, but we will pick up the, the key elements within that um, as we go through the, the approach to the whole programme, but I'll come back to you a bit later if, if that's okay, Chair. Uh, 
thanks, Chief. I'll, I'll just make a start while we get back onto the, the original slide. So, my name is Leon Parks. I'm going to cover a couple of slides on um, our approach to developing the outline business case, uh, why we came up with what we did, and how we arrived there. So, the first thing to point out was that we had some priorities. So, just going back to the, the comments Kevin made earlier. Uh, and the chief just shortly after was um, some really important things for us and the first one being uh, more devolved power to the front line uh, really important issue for us moving forward to really make that uh, the point around the ability for fire crews and frontline staff to make decisions and deal with situations uh, through clear frameworks but actually to support them in making them decisions and uh, aligning that to respect, culture and trust and some of the key words that you will have seen uh, in the earlier slide. We wanted to focus on the role of the firefighter uh, and as was mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to refocus the role to the firefighter role map. So these are outlined job descriptions which talk about what, we ex what nationally uh, is expected of a role of a firefighter. We wanted to move to a more place-based approach to our prevention work. So for a number of years now, we've been targeting safe and well uh, inspections as an example. Um, but actually, we want to shift that to more, a more place-based approach where the priorities for our prevention work are coming from the local areas, from various partner agencies who are sat around that table. We wanted to put together some evidence-based fire cover proposals uh, and I'll cover that in a little more detail uh, in the following slide. As I mentioned before, build, building a culture of trust, respect and accountability at all levels throughout the organisation was really important to us. From the outset, we wanted to develop a refreshed vision and purpose, uh, and this meant looking at our vision, our mission, our, object, our strategic objectives for the organisation and how we're going to take that forward. We looked at a new delivery model for prevention, which links to the place-based working uh, aspect I've just referred to. We also wanted an increased focus on our protection activities. So this will enable us to respond to the challenges and learning from incidents, for example, Grenfell, and make sure that we're in a better position to respond to what comes out of the Grenfell inquiry and other incidents of note. And most importantly, we wanted to develop a model or some proposals for a model which could be sustainable moving forward and would be affordable within the, the, the delivery model. So, the new target operating model was developed and we come up with a refreshed vision, mission and strategic objectives. Uh, we developed these centrally and then we worked with a people reference team and the representative bodies to refine these further. The fire cover review itself looked at every single aspect of our operational response capability. And as you can see from the slide, we broke that down into 33 separate projects. So there was an inordinate amount of work undertaken in a fairly short period of time. And actually what we did, what, one of the priorities for me uh, at leading that piece of work was to look backwards in terms of our data, to look at demand. But the important aspect was to look at our risk profile and we could look forward in terms of what's around the corner. Uh, so we don't respond directly to demand, we look at what's, what our future risk profile might be as well. Over 300 separate models were developed and put through the system and we were able to work on their models and look at how that affected our, in, the impact on response times, the impact on crews, the number of fire engines, the location of fire stations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as we undertook this piece of work, it was really important that we worked with some external agencies just to check that our methodology and approach was sound. And actually what the data was telling us at the out, from the outset was um, stacked up. Uh, and we worked with two independent bodies, one called Risk Tech and one called Green Street Berman to help us along that journey. Having done all this work, we narrowed it down to a series of what we classed as feasible options uh, for the fire cover in Greater Manchester. Uh, and these were presented to the steering group, uh, and we'll talk through the governance arrangements later on. Um, and one of them options was put forward as a preferred option to go in the outline business case. Um, the reform of prevention, the proposals set about see or seek to put firefighters at the heart of our prevention activity. Uh, delivering 
place-based working, uh, of home fire risk assessments, youth engagement, uh, and other aspects of prevention uh, at the front line. As I mentioned earlier, review of protection, responding to Grenfell and other, other, uh, other learning. And again, this includes our firefighters being involved in that work moving forward. And there's an important factor here around firefighter safety, because by firefighters undertaking some low-level fire protection work, they, they get a broader understanding of building design and construction. So if they attend an incident at a building, they have a greater knowledge of uh, how that building might react in the event of a fire. So we see that as a really positive step forward. We also looked at uh, a review of our ad administration provision, and the idea behind this was to look at uh, streamlining our systems. Uh, we've got many, many systems, uh, some of which don't talk to each other, some of which overlap each other, and we see a fantastic opportunity to try and harmonize some of that admin systems and look at how we provide administration for the organization moving forward. So, moving on to the proposed package. The, uh, what we put in the outline business case, and this again, this was narrowed down from the, the, the options appraisal, was the removal of six fire engines uh, at the stations you can see identified, uh, crewing levels of four on all fire engines, to alter the shift times on our non, uh, our non shift duty system stations. The, these stations are the stations where we staff them uh, with firefighters between the hours of nine to five, and then after five o'clock, they proceed from a local area from their home or a base. Uh, so we wanted to look at the start and finish times of them, the number of firefighters on them stations, and actually some of the pay packages that we currently align because they've fallen behind a little bit. We also proposed to undertake uh, three station mergers uh, around Bolton, including Bolton Central and Bolton North, Manchester, which included Central and Phillips Park, and Stockport, which included Stockport and White Hill. If we implemented all of this package, we could run the model and the impact on the response time for the first appliance to get in attendance and make some form of intervention was around 10 seconds. And I say around 10 seconds because unless we've identified a site for a fire station, we can't pinpoint that. So we're working within an area. Uh, once we've pinpointed an actual site for a new fire station, we can more accurately define that. But it's in and around 10 seconds. And obviously the proposal around a new delivery model for prevention, protection, youth engagement and our administration was set out in the business case. In terms of delivering some of this, and I mentioned the, the administration earlier as an example, um, there was uh, a need to reinvest in the futures of the service. The short-term factors, which Kevin alluded to earlier, around the introduction of a new shift system for our whole-time fire stations, uh, and new annu annual leave arrangements for the stations was put in place fairly quick. Um, in the longer term, one of the things that we recognised was a need to reinvest in our stations. And again, there's been mention of some of the station conditions, a lack of female facilities on some of the stations, and a need to invest in that fabric uh, to make them stations a fit place to, for firefighters to work out of. Um, we also wanted to look at investment in operational appliances and equipment because that's really, really important and it enhances firefighter safety. We've already committed to purchasing 24 new fire engines in Greater Manchester, uh, two new technical res rescue units, four high-reach ladders, and I think you, you, you got sight of one of the new ones, which was around the back. Um, just as an example, but we've got other operational equipment which we'll need to invest in, such as breathing apparatus in the near, in the near future. And that's about ensuring that our firefighters have the best, most up-to-date equipment that is available to make them, to enhance their safety. There was also something around improving training and development, and obviously one of them areas is around investments in our training sites. So this is a site, for, you know, as an example. Um, so we want to we want to continue to invest in this site and make it, you know, a world-class facility, a training facility for our firefighters. You will have seen the high-rise facility around the back. Greater Manchester is one of the few organisations in the country who's got that facility. And when we talk about some of the outcomes from Grenfell and the need to train with high-rise, 
as we move forward. You know, we, 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 want, to, we want to be positioned in a really strong place. Um, and investments in supporting technology and systems. And I've already alluded to uh, the many, many systems that we have uh, within the Fire and Rescue Service uh, and our desire to harmonise some of them systems and have a more efficient and effective approach as we move forward. So I shall move on now to the uh, consultation. I'll pass you over to the Deputy Chief Fire Officer. Thank you, Leon. Okay, um, just some dates as far as the consultation was concerned. Um, the consultation started after the Mayor had met with the representative bodies on the 14th of March, and that's when internal consultation started, with the public com uh, consultation starting on the 29th of March. Um, it was a 12-week consultation, uh, which closed on the 31st of May, um, and uh, out of that, a very detailed report, which you'll be pleased I'm not going through, um, has been created, um, which will be presented to the steering group on the 29th of July. Um, at that time, we also initiated weekly meetings with the trade unions, uh, with Unison and with the FBU, um, which I chaired and my colleagues supported me. And we went through the outline business case taking a topic at a time, with those 11 meetings in total, and we also created an issues log and tried to answer all the questions that they brought up as we went through that outline business case. Um, the, as far as uh, the, the overview, we, we recognize that this was not the best time to be out of consultation, uh, and so the uh, communications team worked extremely hard to publicize the, the consultation, uh, and they used social media because they recognized that that's where, how you can uh, reach the, the most number of people. Um, they, they really had a three-pronged attack. They uh, was communicating with the public, and mainly talking about what are the assets and where they might be, discussing and talking with our staff, um, which, uh, welcomed comments upon any part of the outline business case and also with the representative bodies. Despite all this work, we unfortunately had a very low response rate from the public um, and we had some 402 online responses and 50 emails, which uh, in comparison to other public consultations is relatively low, but does tend to show how the public tends to take its uh, fire and rescue service for granted uh, until it actually needs us. We, um, who responded and what did they say? Uh, you've got the detail there of some uh, local MPs and some of their comments that, that they made. Uh, and also we had uh, responses from three fire and rescue services who were basically pointing out and complimenting, complimenting, uh, Greater Manchester Fire Service on some of the work that we've done around um, driving safely, uh, our community work with the health, um, and also cross-boundary working with Lancashire. Um, we also offered to, to go out to local authorities and to talk to teams, um, and the offer was also made to, to local MPs um, for us to, to talk about the outline business case. Uh, and we did receive responses from a number of local authorities and from Greater Manchester Police. Uh, and you'll see the sort of comments that they made there. And also from our health and social care partners. Um, other groups and organizational stakeholders. Um, again, we've worked obviously extensively with partners, um, particularly around our youth work, uh, and the, our Prince's Trust, uh, and so a number of those partners wanted to express their admiration for the work and the benefit that they had seen coming out of that work, uh, and so they took the opportunity of the consultation to talk about that rather than to talk about the wider outline business case. And then moving on to most talked about subject areas, this is really uh, a reflection of the internal responses so, as you can imagine, uh, with these responses coming from our own staff, there was more detail there. 
Um, they talked about the role of the firefighter, trying to understand sort of what firefighters might be expected to do in the future, um, and also uh, querying whether there would be the time to actually do that. Obviously, there was questions around the fire cover review, seeking to understand the modelling behind that, um, and to put other opinions forward. And then place-based delivery, which was primarily concerned about our prevention work and how we should take this forward if we're not going to do it in the same way as we've been doing it in the past. So really, these were the, the key areas that uh, everybody was talking about. Um, and uh, we've distilled that um, into a very detailed document, which is, it will be presented, as I say, to the steering group at the end of this uh, month. Uh, for, so that they understand the, the, the depth of the feeling uh, that, uh, that has arisen out of the consultation. But as I say, it's mainly from internal uh, staff groups and also the representative bodies who, despite giving them an extra week to respond, actually probably took about um, two weeks, but maybe from the length of their response, you can see why. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, just before I, I bring Kevin back in, I'll start on, on the uh, next steps in terms of how we plan to take the, the overall programme forward. Um, we've already put in interim structural changes in, in relation to exploring the impl implications of implementing the OBC as it stands. We've got eight work streams already established, and, and I'll come back to them a bit later in, in relation to the Home Office Inspection Report. But th these work streams are, are aimed at developing the key areas within the outline business case proposals to so just try and um, illustrate and work out exactly what the um, implications of implementing the recommendation are, how we do it, who do we need to involve, how do we ensure that there are cross-cutting cross in involvement and issues identified, and how do we engage people <coughs> excuse me, within the organisation as we take this, this programme forward. Um, I think it's fair to say also that, that the work that we're doing in those areas, even if the programme for change wasn't in place, it's the sort of work we would be wanting to do anyway as an organisation. Um, you could argue some of it is business as usual, it will become that, I suspect. But in terms of a programme for change, we're not fundamentally changing the direction of travel of the organisation. What we're trying to do is change the way that we do things, how we do things, um, and the behaviours that we adopt to, to implement that. Uh, and also delivering uh, a financial um, target within within that whole program. As Don said, the, the consultation was extensive. We, we've tried to package that up into a series of recommendations, which we'll take to the mayor uh, later on, um, probably this month, uh, in order that he can give full consideration to, to the feedback from all parties. Um, but at this point, I'd, I'd, Kevin, if you want to come back in and, and talk about the mayor's um, negotiate and remit that was circulated. Thanks very much, Jim, um, and thanks to the colleagues for the detail there. I think it's probably just to conclude this kind of section, Chair, worth going through some of the issues that have, have been raised and how the Mayor is proposing through the Chief Officer and the Head of Paid uh, Service who are conducting meetings with both Unison and the FBU at the moment in both discussion and negotiating format to try to resolve outstanding issues, what some of those outstanding issues are in particular. One that's been raised is the role of the firefighter, and as I said in the introductory remarks, that has changed over the years in Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, and looking at the safe and well visits, the responsibilities of the firefighters in terms of being a, uh, local decision making, and also in terms of the youth engagement uh, provision that they can make. So, in terms of the role and the safe and well visits, we're looking to make sure that the, the visits that firefighters do are absolutely in collaboration with our place-based teams across Greater Manchester. So it could be a referral out of one of those place-based teams to fire for a visit because of particular indicators and reasons why someone may be at risk 
or it could be a report in from the fire service having visited someone for a particular reason that actually they believe there may be other issues that the place-based team may wish to address with them. So it's actually giving their visits very much a fire-related focus, but making sure they are co-joined with the place-based teams that we're developing across Greater Manchester. The second around youth engagement, uh, I think the firefighters uh, were actually quite enthusiastic about taking back part of the role about youth engagement that perhaps had been stripped away in previous years. But we also recognise that the youth engagement team as part of uh, GMFRS was doing good work, particularly around the Prince's Trust. And we're looking at uh, funding that we have within the combined authority <coughs> for Prince's, Prince's Trust work to see if we can align the two and thus be able to move some of that frontline youth engagement work back, back to the front line whilst actually ma maintaining a degree of youth engagement provision um, perhaps to, to service that front line but also bringing it in to the work that the combined authority is doing with the Prince's Trust. So actually as you would expect of a single organisation bringing these various threads together. Um, the Mayor is absolutely determined that there will be no compulsory redundancies. There are no redundancies planned amongst firefighters but clearly members will have seen the report that indicates a number of uh, redundant posts within the non-operational uh, area of the fire service and as I say the mayor is determined that there will be no compulsory redundancies. We're working closely with Unison in terms of the HR requirements to both look at the offer of early severance, of early retirement and then there will be the ability for staff to be redeployed across the family of the GM combined authority and that includes police where I'm pleased to say that we have an agreement for continuous service now with GMP for staff that may wish to move across in that way. They can do so within other parts of the combined authority and we're working with our 10 leaders to identify posts that may be uh, or vacancies that might be uh, within local authority areas and giving staff within the GMFRS the first um, application to those particular posts all with respect to avoiding any compulsory redundancies um, in that particular area. Um, the Mayor has also said he wishes to maintain firefighter numbers at or above those that he inherited in May 2017, so therefore not drop into those that were proposed within the 2016 IRMP, but maintain them at a higher level. Certainly for the year 1920, um, there are discussions going around the mergers that um, have been indicated, but I think most parties seem to be accepting uh, that those mergers ought to go ahead. The implications of maintaining crewing levels at the levels that the, uh, the Mayor inherited in 2017 do mean that we will need to reduce the number of pumps, probably down to the number of 48. But let's bear in mind also that whilst 56 might be the number on the books, as it were, on average, GMFRS has only been able to run at 50 pumps. And that is simply because of the numbers in terms of crewing levels. So the reduction would not be um, eight, but would actually be in reality two in terms of the number of pumps. That is certainly worth noting. All of these issues, as I said, are being discussed and negotiated between the Chief Fire Officer, the Head of Paid Service and the two trade unions to see if we can reach that agreement and that settlement on these areas. So no final decisions have yet been taken. But there are two issues that I do think members need to be alert to that are coming towards us and that will have a direct impact if they are not resolved adequately by government. The first is a pensions issue where we will be facing a shortfall of in the region of £5.8 million. If that pensions issue is not addressed and funded in full by government, we will have yet further problems because we will have to find that money. And the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor and all of the leaders have committed to including in the combined authority submission to government about the comprehensive spending review a call and we are going to be talking to other fire services across the country to do a collaborative call on government to properly fund our fire and rescue services across the country. 
If those things do not happen, Chair, we will have to revisit Programme for Change because we will have to balance the budget for the GMFRS and that will, I'm afraid, me mean further cuts. But I think you'll have seen from a letter that went out from the Mayor on the 2nd of July, there is a real desire to use the money that we do have available to get us through this period so that we can ask government for further funding both through the CS CSR and through funding the pensions deficit in full and therefore actually leave GMFRS on a more stable footing as we mo move forward. But some of those decisions are without our control, I'm afraid. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Chair. I think it's important just to, to reinforce one of the points Kevin made there about um, that no final decisions have been made. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's quite relevant because what, what the Mayor has been able to do is, is give us a, a short to medium term indication of where we need to go until such times as that decision has been made and the financial landscape becomes a bit clearer. So we've already started working on the criteria that, that has been set out for us for certainly the remainder of this financial year and going into next year on the basis of the reduction in pumps and the maintaining of, of firefighter levels. So some clarity there is helpful for us in the way that we move forward, but final decisions have yet to be made and that will very much depend on what we bring back to the Mayor at a point in time for him to make a, an informed decision on the way forward, taking into account all the factors, not least of which is, is the financial imperative around this. So just going back to, to what we have to do or what I have to do is for the organisation, Certainly, the, the scale of this programme and the magnitude of it can't just be run in a way which is both informal or without any structure to it. Um, and one of the key things that we've, we've put in, which I'll come on to, is the governance structure around um, the whole programme for change. Um, and in order to implement the proposals, what we've put in place is um, a well-founded and a, a well-respected structure and approach to running a programme of this scale and this nature. The steering group at the top is, is a, the forum where we, we take up the recommendations from our internal program board and the chair of that steering group is the mayor. Uh, also attending and as part of the steering group are the deputy mayor, chief executive of GMCA uh, and other officials including myself who will actually have the final say in terms of the program work that we're taking on and the recommendations that come up from the program board we are taking and held to account through that steering group. Uh, and ultimately, if it was appropriate, through the combined authority itself. But by doing this and having this clear structure in, it might seem slightly bureaucratic, but it, it does work. It does keep us on track. And as senior responsible officer for the whole programme, it gives me some, some comfort and some um, transparency around the formal decision-making process, particularly around the work of the work stream leads, the eight themes that I discussed earlier, to make sure that we are connecting with each other, that the work streams individually and collectively are working towards the recommendations within the outline business case, some of which Kevin alluded to earlier. Um, we've also taken the opportunity, and again, th this is part of our own scrutiny responsibilities, to get some external program assurance. And we've used the facilities of TFGM to provide that expertise. Again, just to challenge some of our approaches, challenge some of our thinking, making sure that we're not going off in the wrong uh, direction or that we're not actually doing things comprehensively in the way that we should and I think within this structure we're almost comfortable in terms of that we aren't missing what we should be doing we're certainly not missing any opportunities to, to, to build proposals in, in, in the right way having said that and, and the, the steering group whilst uh, gives us clear direction from, from the mayor ultimately there is some other there are some other decision making forums that, that we need to consider and we've just put some key dates in the next slide which uh, sets out for, for me and from my organisational point of view some of the, the times, the key times that we have to, to, to comply with and present to our internal programme board and steering group are key in terms of working up the solutions. We report regularly through the deputy mayor and the executive meeting with the deputy mayor. Obviously with the corporate issues and reform, a key platform for us going forward for this and any other areas within the, the organization's activity and ultimately I think towards the end of September I would hope to be in a position to take some recommendations to the combined authority for the mayor to consider in their entirety and um, building on some of the clarity that we've already got but work that we've undertaken even in the last few weeks 
is taking us towards that. And I certainly think the full implications of what's been asked of us in the short to medium term, we can map out all being well that we get the union support uh, and working with them to, to integrate their views into any solutions. So in terms of, of where we are for the programme, um, I'll, I'll pause there. To, there's, there's an awful lot of information there. Um, I've no doubt there are a number of questions which have come to mind. We'll try and answer them. And then I'll come back briefly, if I may, Chair, to just the, the, where the Her Majesty's Inspectorate's report dovetails with the programme for change. Thank you very much, Jim, and, and thank you to you and your colleagues and also to, to Kevin um, for taking us through those issues in a, in a very clear way, I think, really. Any, any comments or questions from members of the committee? Yes, Councillor Jolly first. Um, two sections, really. First of all, about the process and then some particular things which came out of the Salford Council submission. I don't know, I think... If I just talk about the process now, then maybe I can come back with, with, the, with, with the other things later. Otherwise, I don't want, I don't want to hog it too much. Um, on the process, Sol Salford did a fairly, we think, a fairly rigorous consultation internally, and, and a submission has gone in. And we also spoke to the unions. A number of things have come out of that. The unions were very unhappy about certain aspects of the governance and process. Some of them, I think, are, were generally simply because we have a metro mayor. They were unhappy about the deputy mayor's role because they are an appointed figure, but then the mayor makes the decisions. And they were unhappy about the lack of a, a fire um, uh, a fire board uh, committee that they used to be. But again, that's a consequence of the structure. But one thing that was raised a number of times is the scrutiny of this, because which falls to here? And when we had the meeting in March, we were supposed to have this on our agenda for rigorous discussion at both the April and May meetings. The April meeting didn't take place because it was in Quarret. Uh, there was people who couldn't turn up. It was in Perda. People had elections, etc. And in May, as I pointed out at the time, it was un really unfeasible to have a meeting because of the changeover. New members were coming on and hadn't yet been approved. It, as it turns out, the chairs, the, the former chairs dropped off. So the two meetings when we were supposed to look at this during the consultation period never happened. And so here we are after the end of the consultation period with, with this session. And that's not a good look. And it's not a good look for this process being scrutinized at this level. Uh, it's nobody's fault, but, you know, f to the outside, particularly the unions, it looks as though councillors have not been scrutinizing it through these, through these forums. I also notice, for example, on, 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 the, on the screen that's up, um, we're looking at it today, it goes to the program board within a week, so how are what's said today going to be, by anybody, going to be taken into account? We've got it down on that, sh um, on that um, uh, screen that it's coming back here on the 13th of August, but that's the day our work program says we're having a training session on the budgets. So. Is it coming back on the 13th of August? And if it doesn't, does that mean, again, we're not, we're not being able to look at it as thoroughly as we possibly should be looking at it? So those are, those are my concerns about the way the consultation has gone from our point of view and this committee's point of view. As I say, later on, if I can, I'll come back with some specific points about what came out of the Salford consultation rather than, you know, having two, I'll have two bites of the cherry instead of one big bite, if you don't mind. Thank you, Councillor Joy, and I think you, you made some very valid points about this committee's failure, I guess, to consider things in, in March and April. And I suppose we, there's probably a learning point there is that is that we need to operate in the reality of the municipal cycle, uh, and, and probably you know on similar timetables like this, we probably need to be thinking about things in January and February rather than in March and April, I suppose, in future, don't we? Um, just in terms of, of this committee, there obviously isn't a meeting in August, so that so essentially. Times have moved on since that slide was written, I suppose. But we do need, to, we could do to consider whether or not um, it's appropriate for this issue to come back to the scrutiny committee at our sem September meeting, which I think would still be before the the meeting of the combined authority that that finally agrees this. So if things move on, I suppose, because the mayor has made final decisions or proposals between now and then, then I suspect it's appropriate for this whole issue to come back to us to, to at least look at those changes. So we've had another another bite of the cherry, if that makes sense. Does, does that help assure you, Councillor Jolly? Yeah. 
Okay. Good. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I first of all thank uh, fire service officers for the, uh, for the presentation and the work? I think it's been very informative. Um, perhaps from a public perception, perhaps one of the most important slides was presented by Leon, and it was the proposed package, because that sets out the, um, the visible uh, changes uh, that the public might see. And, and I just want to focus on one of those, and it's the, um, the station mergers. Affects us particularly in Bolton because that's one of the three areas where two fire stations will be merged into one. Now, the, uh, the, the impact of that, Leon told us, was that the response times might increase by an average of 10 seconds, which sounds very encouraging. Um, but what I'd really like to know is whether that figure is available at a local level, in other words, what will that figure be for Bolton or for any other authority? Uh, and, and as well as that, that's an average. So I'd, I'd be interested to know what the, the best and worst cases were. So two questions, I suppose, really. The best and worst cases, and can we see figures uh, by local area? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor McLaren, did you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, what, this has obviously been a very um, uh, detailed exercise, a very comprehensive report, but I do get the impression that it's been looked at in isolation. Um, I don't see any reference to how you might be working with the other um, uh, frontline services, say with uh, Greater Manchester Police or the, or the National Health Service or local authorities, or as to how you might be sort of working together to sort of make better use of uh, existing resources uh, and sharing resources or sharing facilities. There is nothing in here that suggests to me that there's been any thinking uh, along those particular uh, lines. It seems to be focusing entirely upon uh, restructuring uh, of the, uh, the fire service, the program for change that were. I would think that the other services are also engaged in what might be called a program for change, if that's the best phrase that we have available. And it's, I'd be interested to know in how we might be able to bring those um, various services together so that they may be able to make uh, a more effective uh, and efficient uh, service and how that if impacts upon response times, not only for fire engines, but for ambulance, for example, uh, uh, that might be responding to the same uh, incident uh, that the fire service are uh, engaged in and the police might also be engaged. And there's nothing in here that tells me that any of those issues have been addressed. Thank you, Councillor Duffield, and then we'll, we'll have some answers, if that's all right. Um, yeah, Duffield. thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just, I'm just going to take David's point and just make some comments at this stage and then maybe come back later. Um, one of the comments that I want to start with is this isn't scrutiny. Being talked at for an hour isn't, isn't scrutiny. It's not, it's not a way to look at this issue in the detail that we need to look at it. And I get that there is a way of a, a control and a, how many meetings we can have and things like that. But this isn't, this isn't scrutiny, this isn't line by line of going through. I think that um, Councillor McLaren's point is really clear about impacts and effects on other services. We, ha we have no idea, we don't hear, we're not taking evidence from, from, from anyone outside of the fire service. And I get that this is where we are at the time, but don't let's kid ourselves that this is scrutiny of these proposals. But I will come back a little bit later and comment further. Thank you. Do people want to answer some of those, those points? Yeah, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of points, really, in, in respect of the, the, the first question uh, around response. You, you're absolutely right. The, the, the proposals put together uh, potentially bring a 10-second impact on the response time. That is at GM level. Um, however, we do have the data for the local levels, um, and I can get that for you, absolutely. There's two particular approaches that we took. So we, we had a response planning standard, so we could measure the pass, pass rate um, and we also looked at the actual attendance times, so we can model both, uh, and we can give you that on a, on a local level uh, for, for any area in Greater Manchester, not a problem. Um, in respect of the uh, sharing estate, the estate stuff and working with other agencies, obviously we, we did have the data. Uh, you're absolutely right. We didn't we didn't directly engage with the GMP and NWAS in terms of doing the analysis, uh, but we did use some of the data in terms of their locations, 
if we were looking for a, a better response site for a fire appliance, why would we go and build a fire station if there's an ambulance or police station in that area? We would have some discussions. So that was looked at, just to reassure you. In terms of the proposals around the, the mergers and the new stations, we have been having some uh, discussions with uh, GMCA colleagues, and they have involved uh, colleagues from NWAS and GMP to talk about the site locations and where we can identify something, the opportunities to share them locations and have a, a more joined up approach. Um, there is another aspect around operations which Tony will cover if that's okay. Uh, thank you, Leon. Just a, a, a potted history. Um, we've have a, we have a history of significant engagement with Greater Manchester Police and NWAS, in particular around helping them with their response to certain issues that take up their time. And within the outline business case, it refers to concerns for welfare, gaining entry for the police when they get uh, need access to buildings, but also response to falls, which are a significant impact on the ambulance service. Both of those areas have been uh, areas that we've worked with with those agencies as pilots in the past over the last five years but because of some challenges with regards to firefighters pay have come to a halt. We recognize that the police and we're still engaging with the police and ambulance services to progress that, but we are to some degree uh, tired because of the national pay negotiations. But it is one of those areas that we have engaged with as in it and is included in the outline business case. The other area that, uh, that um, Leon spoke about with, uh, with regards to estates, again, Familiarisation with, with Great Match Fire and Security Service, if you have some of it, may b you may be aware that we have joint ambulance stations and police stations, Wigan being one of them, a really positive engagement. Phillips Park is another one where we have the ambulance service uh, at one of our locations. Um, and we have a number of police uh, facilities on other stations also. So we do regularly engage with those blue light services. Um, and whilst it may not be implicit within in the outline business case, I suppose to some degree we see that as business as usual. I, I will come back to the, the point you raised before, um, later on if that's okay, but, but on the report, another round of questions? Yes, Councillor Clay and then Councillor Dutton. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, just on regard to the, the consultation, first of all, because um, I, well, I, I speak with the full support of people in the Manchester Labour Group who were very unsatisfied with this consultation. Um, from our point of view, it was carried out during the worst period in terms of the elections, the two elections, one after the other. That's also impacted on the scrutiny committees. We've had, uh, we personally, as backbench members, did not receive any notification requesting comments. So. Um, you may well have passed it on to leaders of councils or executives. It would have been, you know, just as you do with all of the reports that you can send out to every councillor in Greater Manchester, that could have been done. Um, I saw something on one of the slides about how many Facebook impressions. Um, I'd, I'd question the methodology behind that. So impressions on Facebook, the, that could be something that, I flick through like that, you know, that, that means nothing, really. That doesn't mean anything to me. And uh, I, I don't feel there's been a huge engagement in Greater Manchester on this. Uh, that's why we asked uh, that we want the consultation reopened uh, now that people are aware of the issues. They're aware of it now, now that people are starting to make a fuss about it. They weren't aware of it before. And people are concerned. In Manchester, we are building more and more high-rise buildings in the city centre. We don't know if those buildings have been built in a safe way because of issues with cladding and fire safety coming out of the Hackett Review. And we're really not satisfied at all that these proposals seem to be getting railroaded through with minimal time for scrutiny, consultation, and working at looking at the details. And that's all I'll say about the process for now. I'll come back with details on some of the specifics later on and give other members a chance, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I echo what actually Councillor Ben has just said there. Um, scrutiny is about looking at the detail, looking at the consultation package, listening to what the firefighters have had to say. And I've got nothing in this report that explains to me what their views are, the people at the front line. To reduce from a fire 
you know, five people to four is a safety issue. Uh, and I know the firefighters I've spoken to over the last uh, like six months are very concerned about that. I don't see their report at all. I don't see how this consultation is a true consultation. You can listen to people and then totally ignore it. And personally, that's how I believe this has been handled. And I don't believe we're getting a true reflection of the staffing levels, the safety issues. We've already heard, and it's been mentioned, that there's an increase. Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, the increasing of our housing stock. We're increasing the housing stock. Now, how on earth we can reduce fire tenders, firefighters on the tenders, uh, and I've, I'm going to use Haywood as an example, going down to one tender at Haywood, where on that site alone we have the water sort of like safety, um, you know, rescue team, uh, and if they were taken out of Haywood, then that side of Rochdale would have no cover hardly. Uh, so it, it's, it's the detail that's missing, uh, and to scrutinise this report, I think we need to go in more depth. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I would fully support the comments that my three colleagues have made about scrutiny, but that's not the reason I'm uh, on now. Uh, Kevin mentioned uh, the pension deficit and the fact that he was hoping that uh, UK taxpayers would pick up the bill and fund that. Uh, now, my question really is, have we a plan B? Because you seem to imply that we, if uh, you didn't get that 5.8 million, then the, then this would fall, so is there a plan B in place already? And if you do get that money, are you going to guarantee that the pension fund won't fall into deficit again? Okay, do you have some answers? Do you want to start on that one, Kevin? Or, yeah. Thank you, Chair, if I may, yes. Um, and just to point out that actually the reason for the pensions issue is because of the legal case against government, which HMG actually lost. Um, so actually it is a government issue that is now rebounding and it will come to local authorities, it hit police last year, it's coming to fire as well, it's actually coming to pretty much all of us around this table. So it is not an issue of a pensions deficit created in Greater Manchester, this is a national issue th that the government was taken through the courts and lost its case. And now it's, someone told me today, it's several billions of pounds that the government is going to have to find or force other organisations to find through whatever means. So it isn't a, a, a local issue in terms of that pensions one, is the first thing to say. Um, in terms of a plan B, well, we effectively have plan B here in some respects. It is the programme for change in the outline business case, because if we do not get government support for that pensions deficit that we're going to face, that nearly £6 million, then we will have to revisit programme for change in terms of what that means for frontline firefighters, number of pumps and non-operational staff again, I'm afraid. It's not satisfactory, it's not where we want to be. It is very clearly why the Mayor has committed to actually, if that pensions uh, issue is addressed by government, this is how we can actually make progress by maintaining the numbers that we currently have drop in only two pumps to 48 instead of uh, 50 and, or, and all the other issues that are detailed in uh, both the programme for change and the outright business, business case. I would also point uh, members to both of those documents because they were produced at a previous scrutiny meeting that members considered and actually engaged when the mayor was there, the chief officer and his colleagues were there. So there has been opportunity for members of scrutiny committee to look in detail at both the business case, the outline business case and the programme for change case in full line by line detail. Uh, I obviously can't comment on the fact that the April meeting that was also going to look at this was uh, not quora, but there is, and. Uh, We've been clear this evening that there is opportunity for members to continue to feed in, albeit the formal consultation process has finished. The fact is there is still engagement happening, there are still discussions happening because no final decisions have been taken. So comments from colleagues are still able to feed in uh, to that process. Um, so I think that's important to say. But actually the reason for the lengthy presentation tonight is reflecting on what members of the committee said in March, which was actually they didn't have, in their view, the ability to read such hefty documents as the programme for change in the outline business case, 
we felt rather than if you know members have now since March had that opportunity that tonight we would go through all of the key issues that have come from those two documents and do it in a way that hopefully took members through. So I'm afraid we are trying to achieve a balance chair to support and help the members of the committee. One is through the production of the documents, the other is through the slide presentation and taking through the key issues. Um, if members feel we haven't satisfied that, then I'm sorry, but that was what we have been trying to do. Um, thanks, Gavin. So we, there's quite a few members of the committee have raised sort of issues around scrutiny of this process. So I suppose there's a, there's a couple of things, really. So, so one is, um, Councillor Duffield, you sort of raised a, a very valid point about, about how if we're going to look into an issue in a, in a slightly deeper way, it may be that we want to hear from st other stakeholders rather than, rather than just officers of, of the command authority and, it, and, its, and its agencies, I suppose. And I think that's probably something we should look into as we, as we go through issues going forward. And that's what good scrutiny would be, I suppose, isn't it? But uh, we also need to be mindful if we're going to do that, we, we probably need to look at slightly less issues well, if that makes sense, rather than try to do everything um, with, with, with less well. So that, that's one thought. I mean, I suppose there's a question to fire colleagues as about your consultation process about whether or not you've reflected whether or not that's been sufficient, whether there is any thought about reopening that. So that's just a question to you. And then the other, the other opportunity is, is that I suspect um, there's a feeling that we do need to revisit this issue again at our September meeting, perhaps in a slightly different way, and perhaps focusing on, on a couple of key issues that we can tease out or, or things that are, you know, because this is obviously going to be an issue for public debate between now and September as well. So perhaps if we could try and clear the agenda a little bit during September to, to have another, another look at some of these key issues would, would perhaps at least help members. But on the consultation process, is that something that you've reflected on? And I suspect you're going to say it's not going to be reopened, but I will ask you if, that, if it is going to be. Chair, thanks. Um, I think at the outset, the, when the consultation period was set, I think, we, I think twice it was extended given comments that came back to us. So early, early on from, I think it was an original six weeks, it was doubled to, was it 12 weeks in its total? And that was as a direct response to individual concerns from representative bodies that they needed additional time. In addition to that, we accepted submission from the representative bodies even after that 12 week period was closed. So whatever they've submitted, we've already taken on board, recorded, uh, and are, are factoring that into the overall um, report that will be submitted to, to the, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor in due course. Uh, perhaps if I could just explain or give a, a personal view about how we as an organisation see scrutiny fitting into to where, where we are because I wouldn't like members to get the impression that, that in any way, shape or form that scrutiny is something that we don't value, we don't welcome. For me, certainly as a Chief Officer, the scrutiny and certainly this committee from, from the time I've been here, I've seen the scrutiny role has been absolutely vital for, for me and my organisation to do, to do what's right and doing it in the right way. And I think what we've been able to do, in, in certainly in the last year or so, is identify not just the good stuff, but where we've got issues and we've brought it to scrutiny, encourage the challenge, encourage the dialogue. Um, and at this point in time, we're in no different position. And I would certainly want to make sure that that's a philosophy that carries on. The actual... Um, document the outside outline business case was released formally at the end of March. So we're, we're only about what, four months into that. So when you take the 12 week consultation period into it, we, we're only sort of four months on since it was launched. And during that time through both the steering group and the governance structures that we've had, there has been significant challenge in everything that we've been discussing. And we've certainly been extremely open and transparent in everything that we've done, the briefings that we've done with some councils, with leaders, everything has been on the table, we've had nothing. And I think some of the feedback that we've had is that A, it's been appreciated and B, it's dismantled some of the, the um, comments that have been factored in or fed into to some of the political groups. And we've been able to actually say, actually, the reality is this. So our whole approach has been very much about open, openness and transparency, but also encouraging the scrutiny, whether it be from this group, from the deputy mayor's office and the mayor's office through the steering group to, to all the other examples up there. So. From, from an officer point of view and an organisational point of view, just you know, to reassure you that anything that you want to have a look at or interrogate us on, we're more than content to do so. Equally, 
this programme has to move on at some pace. I can't stop the whole programme because already the organisation finds itself in a position where some of the uncertainty around it, for good reason, isn't helping us move on with the changes. Um, and if we don't keep moving with the process and with the changes, um, it will be even more difficult to implement and do what's asked and expected of us in the right way. So we, we face, an, I certainly face a number of challenges in making sure this programme continues, but rest assured the openness is there for us and for you to challenge at any point in time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Another round of questions. Oh, sorry, Kevin, do you want to come back on something? Sorry, Chair, if I may, just on that, um, just to re-emphasise what the Chief uh, Fire Officer said, that actually um, the original proposal was for a six-week consultation. That began back in February, but then with agreement uh, with both Unison and FBU, that was extended twice, um, which is why it then actually ended up going through the election period until post-election. That was not the intention, but we met the requests to extend the consultation period quite deliberately because we did not, the Mayor did not want to have it curtailed. We wanted to do the maximum statutory period that we could. Um, I would reiterate, though, that um, comments are still being taken on board, so it's not as if it's closed or a done deal. Um, and I accept, and the Mayor, I think, would accept, that the timing was not ideal. You know, no one would plan to try to do something like this during an election period or lead up to an election period. But the fact is, we had the, the work had to be done to prepare the programme for change and the outline business case. We had, obviously, to go through a proper formal consultation um, about the proposals. And there was also the issue of a deficit, a budget deficit, having to be addressed. And, of course, the longer you leave that, the worse the consequences can be. So we did not want to... Um, have a, a further impact on the service and therefore it, it meant just getting on with it at the appropriate times. It certainly wasn't planned in that way. Okay, thank you. So further round of questions? Yes. Councillor Birch. Birch yes. uh, thank you, Chair. Just to say again, thank you ever so much for the very insightful tour and for the warm welcome. And I guess it's important for us to um, to emphasize that we are scrutinizing the decisions and it's absolutely nothing personal. We, we, we were discussing with colleagues how much we appreciate what firefighters do. Some people sit in the office 95 and firefighters put themselves at risk every day. So it, it, we do appreciate what the firefighters do f for us. Um, re regarding the scrutiny, um, just a few things, I guess some detail uh, would be helpful. The removal of six second fire engines is mentioned in the report. And also, we were told today that there will be some new engines introduced. Is that to upgrade the first engines? Is that right? Yeah, the, the new fire engines are to replace some to of replace our aging right. fire engines, yes. Okay. And also, new delivery model for um, prevention, protection, youth engagement. Um, in Salford, our population is younger than uh, um, the average age in, um, in the country, really. Most antisocial behavior is done by young males. Um, so for us to engage with them, there is even in my ward of Odsal, there is so much. Uh, there are so many activities for young people. It's just difficult to engage those who just don't want to engage. And um, Princess Trust, and the firefighters, they were, um, they have been for years role models that we could not possibly engage, that, that we just, we, we have no cap we have no ability to attract and, um, and get the attention of those young men who commit, I mean, who, who are the drain obviously on, um, on finances, but also cause on social behavior, low levels of crime, and then get to, to commit uh, high levels of crime. Um, so I just believe that reducing, you know, new delivery model, um, I believe that there will be, you are looking at the reduction of engagement with young people, and, and I don't think long term it's a productive and constructive reduction, or we're not, we're not going to be making savings, we're going to see high levels of crime, and, you know, the, the money will be coming out the other, you know, from, from somewhere else spent on tackling and social behavior, and believe it's something like 56,000 pounds 
to, to look after um, a minor in prison. Uh, correct me if it's wrong. But it is he, I don't think this is the way to save money, possibly with, um, for the fire and rescue service. Uh, but in the long term and overall, I don't think it's going to be saving money. So youth engagement, uh, I say, is a huge priority for us in, in Salford, in Ortsal as well. And also, this um, Ortsal is the second fastest developing area in, um, in the country. We don't feel that um, that has been taken into consideration. And today, I believe, at a meeting earlier on, I heard that Manchester is the, has got more cranes than anywhere in, in Europe. I don't know if that's a true statistic. Anywhere else in Europe. Um, so the population is obviously growing exponentially, just unprecedented growth in, in Salford. We're going to have all out elections next year because of that. And how reducing the number of, of in, you know, firefighters, how, even though, even though we, we are going to have um, re redundancies, um, as we heard, I, 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 it just battles, you know, I, I can't understand that. We've already got more than 11,000 dwellings approved in Ortsal, not in Salford, in Ortsal. How reduction in, in fire service is going to be helpful, uh, I, I, I just can't fathom that. Um, also, um, terror, terror threat, th um, you know, it, it, I'm not saying anything new. We all know that the, the threat of terrorism it is higher now than it was 10 years ago. Not so long ago, we received um, an anti-terrorism traffic order asking us as councillors in Salford to approve, make comments. So obviously they know something, uh, GM, GMP knows something to, uh, to establish, to implement that. And again, if they are um, making uh, steps to prevent Greater Manchester from, you know, from what is uh, written on the can from the terror attack, how reducing the, again, reducing the uh, frontline firefighters is going to be in step with what is happening in Utsal, in Salford, in Greater Manchester, it, it, it doesn't match up. Um, I, I do believe that possibly great, a little bit more in depth looking into the future of the region in relation to, to, to this issue uh, would be helpful. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Birch. Anybody else? Yes, Councillor Jolly. I'll have my second go. Um, it's it, what I've got in front of me is the Salford Council response. Uh, in Salford, um, Andy Burnham came to speak to the Labour Group, and then we had a series of consultations and put in a response. Um, and it's interesting, the bits that I've highlighted in here I wanted to just mention. Um, most of them have already been covered for other areas, and it's, it's interesting, but perhaps not surprising that that's, that's the case. So, for example, one comment was that an opportunity being lost for cross-agency modernisation, um, as we've heard, but also a specific comment that have we learned from the the um, uh, from what happened in Greater Manchester Police. Um, in regard to things like integrating uh, work into firefighters' roles. Greater Manchester Police went down a similar line, we believe, integrating response in neighbourhoods and are now deintegrating them because it didn't work. Um, so are we going to end up in the same position? Um, then there is partnership working, which is important. Again, have we analysed the re different response time, not just by area, but by time, for rush hours and because of congestion and what the spread will be on that. Um, a specific issue is, is the, I think the most concern that many people have expressed to us is, is reducing to four on per pump. And have we been told that half the country does that already, but have we analysed that? Have we spoke to them? Have we seen their data about what the effect of that is, what problems that can cause, and in particular the concern is at times of high sickness, does that mean we're going to end up with three on some? And is that really going to be a danger? Has that been analysed? Or have we just said it's done somewhere else so we can do it here? 
Youth engagement, extremely worried about that. That has to be maintained. And again, coming back to Councillor Birch, it was something that I was going to mention. Odsall, Councillor Birch's ward, is projected to have a population in five years' time of 27,000. Not an electorate, sorry, not a population, an electorate. Just one ward. That's why we're having ward boundary organisation. There's one new ward, Keys Ward, which presently has an electorate of 6,000, is supposed to be nearly 12,000 within five years. I have seen a thousand planning applications for a thousand new flats in Keys in a single week. That's how, and has all that been analysed? That's a huge extra risk and, and pressure on the response. Has all that been analysed, those demographic changes? And one final point, just about Eccles, and I'll say this because Eccles Fire Station's in my ward, but that, again, a comment from Salford, that is the a water and animal response rescue specialists are there. So if you're down to one pump there, if that's needed for that function, where's your cover for which was which was the second fire, fire for the second pump F and finally that station and the station in Swinton are right on top of the motorway network and the pressures are there for them to be used for motorway incidents I would imagine has all that been analyzed has all that been factored in and where's the data for it thank you councillor Clay thank you yes yeah, so um I think that whole thing about the response times is um, very important. My understanding then is that we're making response times based upon fire stations that we don't actually know where they are yet, which makes it, yeah, so the location, you, you've based those response times upon posited locations for the new stations when you merge stations or no, no, what we do is we look at existing response times because we've got that data and then we look at where our incidents happen so we are able to map on, on a system where we have high densities of life risk incidents and then we can time from the station to where that area is and measure what it might be and we can then move that station around and see what the impact is but we work off existing times so it's actual data. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so... In regard to response times then, do we measure the response time from the time when a call is received in the 999 control station? Because I've had it put to me by members of the unions that the response time is measured from when the appliance leaves the station or from another site. Yeah, so the, the current integrated risk management plan that was referred to earlier, 2016 to 2020, sets out four response standards. Um, they don't include the call handling time. So they are actual times for when the fire engine turns out to when it gets in attendance. What we have proposed in the seven minutes that was referred to earlier is the full, the full range for when you ring 999 to when the first fire engine gets into attendance and an intervention starts to be made by fire crews. Thank you. So I'll just give you a, an anecdote which was relayed to me and uh, members of Manchester Labour Group recently. Um, <coughs> we are supposed to be able to respond to two 10 pump incidents at the same time. Um, there was a recent incident, I believe one was a six pump and one was an eight pump incident, which um, apparently nearly brought the service to its knees. Uh, a damaged engine was put back on the road uh, to help cover. Uh, and after those two incidents in which the Earlham station had deployed its fire engine, its only fire engine because it only has one, um, there was a fire in Earlham and the response time to that fire was 20 minutes. So if you're reducing the amount of engines in lots of stations, yeah, you might have a notional overall mean average response time which is 10 seconds greater but in actual fact, in cer certain circumstances, so I'll give you another set of circumstances. Say it's a, a city centre fire. It happens to be during the rush hour, or perhaps there's a, a Labour or Conservative Party conference on and there's a ring of steel in effect in Manchester city centre, or perhaps there's a, a football match at one of the major football grounds. Now, where does your response time, particularly if an engine is already dispatched from the nearest fire station, where does your response time go then? 
because I tell you, it, it looks extremely worrying to me. Now, I'll just put another point to you, which is that in 1994 to five, the response time in Manchester was under five minutes to a category one fire. Is that correct? That's the information I've been given. That, that may be correct, but it goes back to that point, of, again, that wouldn't, if that was a figure, wouldn't have included the call handling. Because we didn't include it, that, which is two minutes. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 the conversation I had was that that never used to be the case, that the call handling was included back in 1994 to 95, so uh, perhaps, okay. Do you want to, I mean, what I'm saying is, is you, you're giving us a notional time, um, which is based upon an average of, you know, you can no doubt send us a report as to how you arrive at that average, but in actual fact, what's really the problem for us is not the notional average being 10 seconds more, 20 seconds more, or, or 30 seconds less. What actually is the problem is that with less fire cover available across the GM region, than when a serious incident occurs, and bear in mind you're proposing all crews down to four, which means that if there is a serious incident, your own safe systems of work would say that you would not deploy uh, a rescue team into a building with, until you've got five people on site. Is that not correct? Sorry, no, no that's not correct. Um, we, we crew to a level of four on a fire engine, uh, on the most of our fire engines, and to be honest, in my 24 years service, um, we've always done so. Um, in terms of that four, that gives you a rapid deployment, we call it, of two people wearing breathing apparatus to make an entry and rescue while still allowing a pump commander and, uh, sorry, instant commander and uh, pump operator to make the essential radio messages, uh, water uh, uh, issues and equipment. And again, in terms of second appliance arrival, um, we've got some of the best attendants in the country for our second appliance attendance. Now, if I can just go back to some of those other incidents you spoke about, I haven't got the detail about the Earlham incidents, but I can assure you in terms of if there was a six and eight pump simultaneous incident, that would not bring this service to its knee knees. We, we, on a d regular basis, deal with those types of incidents. Um, and it, I believe there was an incident recently, in fact, I think I was principal officer on the day, where there was two protracted, re relatively small incidents, but they did take a number of our officers out of the uh, demands. So we asked for recall for duty for our officers to allow for support for them and their attendance at those incidents, because unlike firefighters where they shift change, our, op our officers during the weekend are on for the whole period of the weekend. Councillor Clare is the moral. Shall I, shall I finish off? Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, the, the understanding I have is that I think we're talking about the same circumstance, is that uh, an appliance which did not have a fully operating pump was put into service, so it could not pump water, but it was put into service um, so that there was additional cover. That was the information I was given, so perhaps you'll be able to um, check on that and come back to us in the future with the details of that. I, I'm, I would be more than happy to. I want to reassure the members here there is no way we'd put a pump on the run that couldn't provide water. Uh, taking crews to an incident where they can't then be provided water is something that would just... Plus the, plus the fact we've got a very, very good maintained um, reserve fleet that where there's uh, spare fire engines uh, located at strategic locations that would support or be put in service if there was an uh, appliance that couldn't work. Okay, thanks. And just finally, on the crew members, so is there not also a breathing apparatus entry control officer? So is that not a role that you have at the moment? And what would happen to that role when you, you, all engines are riding for? Initially, that role, as we have done for 20, maybe 30 years, is done by the pump operator until then the second appliance attends and then the dedicated resources to do that. Um, our hose reels, uh, very effective hose reels, 22 mil, provide significant, significant water for the first stripe breathing apparatus wearers to make an entry for that entry control officer to support them with the hose reel and do the entry control board at the same time. Thank you. I know that you, know, you, you will obviously want to do your best and 
all fire crews will want to respond in an emergency, but obviously we have a duty of care to them to ensure that we do have everything in place to ensure that they're not tempted to take additional risks and that's something that we'd be concerned about in a situation where the services stretch with response times. Can I, can I just, uh, thank you very much and we do appreciate that, that challenge. As a, as the Chief said then, we do appreciate challenge because it's important that we do get that. I, I can only talk from a personal perspective that having had the, the difficult um, job of informing a firefighter's family that had lost his, lo lost his life in Manchester Stephen Hunt's family, that I, as member of CLT, would not allow or, or stand by and let decisions like that to put firefighters' lives at risk. Um, I think it's important to recognise that, as Kevin said then, the financial challenge that this service faces, these are not decisions that we take lightly. And if it was our choice, and we've said this face to face with firefighters, we would have five on every pump, but that's not the position we're in. We're having to put forward some very difficult choices for you to scrutinise and for the Mayor to take. Okay, thank you. And thank, thank you, Councillor Clay. I just wanted to, to come back to the, the points raised by, by the two colleagues from Salford. So I think um, we are going to need to to look at this issue again at, at, our, at our September meeting and it may be useful if we identify as a committee the particular points we'd like to, to, to look at in some detail really. and I, I think one of them that I'm hearing is that um, is the robustness of the plans um, for, I guess it's dealing with the growth of the city region so particularly in, in the in this inner city core of Manchester and Salford but it's also growth in general around congestion and things like that isn't it and, and how we, we can be assured that the fire service proposals are in line with that expected um, high levels of growth in urban areas. Does, does that resonate with the committee? Is that okay? Um, another issue that I wonder whether or not it may be appropriate to look at is, um, and I think I was going to ask, was, was um, you, you talked about before, I think it was Leon, about there were, there were three feasible options, and I guess feasible means financially feasible and, and safe. This was this your definition of feasible. Um, and, and, and the recommended option was the, was the going down to four people, four firefighters on, on a pump. Um, and then the recommendation from the mayor is, is, is to stick at five firefighters. And it's to understand that, that issue essentially, because essentially there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a political viewpoint, which is fine, and there's, a, there's the recommended viewpoint. And it's to understand um, why you recommended four, why you feel that's safe. Um, and then what the financial implications are of, of sticking with five, if that makes sense, because I think that's quite an important difference between the, between the initial proposal and then the mayor's proposal. If that, if that's, is that right, Kevin? Am I understanding that correctly? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, the, the, the business case and the programme for change uh, provided options, um, as was uh, discussed um, back in March, but also by uh, consulted upon um, and in discussions with the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the chief officer and his team. Indeed, also with the FBU and with Unison. The purpose of those discussions predicated on, uh, if you like, the worst case option, which still meant safe fire cover across Greater Manchester could be provided. So that's a worst case option. But there are other options, and you have to take into account what you're hearing, otherwise what is the purpose of meeting with the trade unions, of having a consultation, and having options. That is indeed what the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor have been doing. They have been listening to what colleagues in the trade unions and wider um, have been saying to them. There is an, uh, as the Mayor set out in his letter of the um, 2nd of July, there has been an underspend, and there are reserves that can be used to actually, and I want to assure Councillor Birch that we are not talking about any reduction in frontline firefighters here. Um, the Mayor has been clear that they will be maintained at or above the level he inherited, which was 1121 in May 2017. So they will not reduce to the plans under the previous IRMP of 1058. So that is absolutely critical because we're not talking about reducing firefighters. However, those reserves and that ability to fund, if you like, almost the status quo, if you will, at that level of 544 on the various stations as we have it, can only go through the period 1920 unless we get further government support. 
for both the GMFRS and the pensions issue that we face. If we don't get that financial support, then other things will have to be considered, including the potential of the mayoral precept, including revisiting programme for change and have to implement almost to the worst case option, if that kind of makes sense. I think it is worth just saying, in terms of the fives fours, that in 70% of cases or thereabouts in Greater Manchester, the first engine arrives with a crew of four. No fire service in the country crews every engine at fives. So I think we have to just recognise that we're not talking about all fives or, you know, we're talking about what we can do and what we can maintain here. And even if we do have to reduce, that will be to reduce to a safe level. But nevertheless, we don't want to go there if we can possibly avoid it. Thank you. Are there other points that people wish to raise this evening? Councillor Duffield, uh, um, and also, is th are there other issues that we'd particularly like, particularly like to look into in depth at the next meeting as well? Um, um, thank you, Chair. I think one of the things for the next meeting is really understanding um, what's changed because of the consultation. So what, 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 uh, is it going to be implemented as per that initial consultation document and what, what, what will be different because you've consulted? Um, the other thing I'm, I'm, just, I'm interested in, because um, the Deputy Chief Fire Officer and the Fire Officer have, have done the recommendation of fours, um, I'm interested whether or not in your long careers, whether or not elsewhere you've worked, you've recommended fives and why, and, and is that a difference here for any particular reason? The, the other thing, very quickly, is um, I still think there's a bit of confusion, part of the way, probably because of the way that Kevin laid it out at the beginning, of what you would do anyway and what we're doing because we're still in very deep austerity. And I, th I think there, your, your message is still a little bit confused there about what we have to do and what we're choosing to do. And there, I think your clarity around your message would, would also probably be helpful for us to make sure that we can do some better and proper scrutiny of the, of the work that's in front of us going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Tanya, first. Thank you, Chair. About the numbers of firefighters, sorry to labour this, but is it right that we are saying that the mayor is saying that the numbers of firefighters will no will not go below the numbers that were in 2017? Is that right? Right. But have there been new firefighters f hired until now? Because we're obviously in 2019. Um, so, so if, if 2017 we had so many and we, fi and we hired new ones and now it's 2019 and we are not going to get below 2017 and we have some fi 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 more firefighters, so I is that redundancies but not going lower than 2017? I'm sorry, I, I, am I being too, you know, splitting hairs here? If I can answer that fairly quickly, Chair, um, the number in May 2017 was 1121 firefighters. The plans under the 2016 IRMP were to reduce to 1058. As of May 2019, because of the accelerated recruitment, there are 1183 firefighters. So it, there's no redundancies amongst firefighters, but of course every year a number of firefighters leave, whether it's on retirement or for other careers or, or whatever reasons. So you have to recruit almost to stand still. So what the Mayor is saying about not reducing below 1121 is there may be some fluctuation within that in terms of the number of people leaving, but we will continue to recruit to maintain that level at or above 1121. Okay, thank you. So I've got Councillor McLaren and then Councillor Clay, and that might have to be it this evening. But lots of references to the to the financial situation, to the budget, etc. Now and what it may look like in 12 months' time, possibly. Um, it perhaps is something that we need to understand more fully. Uh, uh, at this stage and it will give us a better overall impression of what the implications might be if uh, plan A as it were um, uh, doesn't materialise but at the same time it also gives us a, an opportunity to 
uh, compare uh, the fire service budget with what may be happening in the health service, etc. Because there's a clear emphasis as far as health is concerned on prevent. And given the situation that we are now appear to be potentially moving towards, we might be talking about prevent uh, in this context uh, also. So that has implications in terms of how we utilize uh, existing and future uh, resources and I think it's perhaps something we need to get a handle on at this stage chair rather than wait for uh, the possibility of having to you know consider implementing plan B thanks chair actually very similar um, I think well, first of all I should say I, I wouldn't ever try and imply that people would not have regard to you know life and, and safety because absolutely of course uh, and we all have that thought in our minds as well which is why it's such a serious issue we're talking about but in terms of the prevention um you know we talk about invest to save and uh, you know certainly in health and social care we're trying to um, get ahead of the ever increasing demands by um spending on things that are going to prevent people staying in hospital and stuff like that obviously all the work we're talking about with in the community with fire prevention uh, working with young people to prevent um antisocial behavior and you know people messing around setting fires and things like that all of that kind of stuff is really important and obviously some of the stats in the previous report which I, I know I came in late for what I have read um, relates to the good work that's been done by yourselves over the last few years to get those things down and it would be um, extremely unfortunate if due to financial circumstances we were to take a a short-term approach fo focused on what we think we have to protect and then as a result lead to a situation where there's great demand in the future and and you know more fires and more property destruction which obviously we all want to avoid as well so yeah we do need to look at what that work is and how that's done and who does it uh, and who who's best to do it because i think other people have mentioned you know is it best to be done by firefighters or other staff okay thank you very much members i think um we, we've identified some some issues that we'd like to to dive in a bit more deeper if that's okay next time um, and i think we just added to the list there the, the issue around prevention of fires as well and things like that and also cancer duff field um is to understand i suppose the the, the actual outcomes of the consultation and, and what what has changed as, as a result of the consultation i think i think that with those two that gives us four issues to to look at in more detail next time um and through you, Joanne, I think we'll perhaps consult with members over the summer to, to find the best way of doing that and make the best use of that September meeting with, with colleagues as well. Okay. So the, just the, the final thing we have on fire, Jim, is you're just going to very quickly give us the highlights of the HMICRFS report, but we will get this properly at a future meeting. That's right. Uh, the purpose in, in, in flagging this up just now was um, twofold. One, it's the first inspection we've had for checking with colleagues. It must be at least 15 years um, when the fire service inspectorate was disbanded. We are now under the HMI constabulary and fire and rescue service. So police and fire are now under the same inspectorate regime. Uh, and this is the first time we've been inspected in Greater Manchester under this regime. Uh, it's quite a different approach. It's, it's been a mixed group of people who've, who've come and inspected, a combination of police and fire personnel, uh, which has been, been quite uh, constructive in a number of ways. Uh, I think, again, reiterating what I said earlier about being open and transparent with, with this group and with other groups that are in scrutiny, the approach that we took with the Home Office Inspector was very much a similar in a similar vein, and that we were very open and honest about where we felt we were as an organisation. And I think it's quite encouraging in most respects that the findings that they've come out with are very much what we told them about. There'd be no surprises. There's nothing come in that they've found which we weren't aware of uh, and didn't flag up with them. Uh, and whilst the overall ratings perhaps on the face of it don't look um, particularly impressive, I think from my perspective and where the organisation finds itself and given the, the background that Kevin set out right earlier on in the meeting, I think, it's, I think it's a fairly reasonable reflection of where the organisation finds itself um, and also gives us quite a clear steer in the direction of travel that we want to make, which encouragingly is quite similar to what we've got within the programme for change. There's nothing in here that, that is in conflict with what we're trying to do. 
and again as an organization doing its business as usual these are areas that we would want to develop and the detail within the report which has been formulated into an action plan which we have to respond to again it's something that i wanted to flag up now but we will bring back for you to have, have a closer look at because again we've got 56 days to respond to this um, and then there'll be regular updates that we have to provide the mayor and deputy mayor quite quite rightly will be expecting us to give them updates on where we are but equally it fits very nicely with the program for change and in fact underpins some of the evidence base that we've we've always sought to put into any proposals that we have so at, I say at this point in time it's very much an early heads up uh, I think they I hope the scrutiny committee can take some comfort from the fact that uh, we, have, we have got some areas of very good practice uh, we might want to or we have tried to challenge the inadequate rating under the fairness and promoting diversity and the, we had some contentious discussions with them and on one hand they were saying we're le leading nationally in certain things and then they, they give us an inadequate rating however uh, i think we, we find ourselves with those with those scores and we'll take them and, and work on them as we go forward for two years time when they come back but i think as, as the first inspection for many many years i think it's helpful to have that line in the sand for us and there's certainly, and again, Chair, there's plenty within that that I think the committee can, can have a look and challenges on and certainly will be open to that and bring that back also. Okay. Is that okay with people? So, so I guess we look, we'll look forward and we'll plan in the best time in the year to, to look at that in, in greater detail, if that's okay, Jim. Good. So, so just um, we, we spent the whole evening obviously looking at, at fire issues. I just wanted to, to thank the, the, the officers from their fire service for for your input and, and you'll obviously see that as a committee we're very interested in in what you do and and and, and getting the best solution there um final I agenda items are for information only so the data next meeting is tuesday the 17th of september at churchgate house but also we are meeting on the 13th of august in a training session to learn about budgeting and then the final agenda item is to note the gmca register of key decisions which people can look at online. But otherwise, thank you very much for your attendance. And this is probably the coolest meeting venue that we'll ever have, isn't it? So back to, back to the boring meeting room next time, but thank you.